to talk about how society, how people together can steer complex adaptive systems and work we do on that. Um, just briefly before I go into the work that I do, I wanted to just say that in the social sciences and the humanities, almost everything that we do and look at is emergent. You know, that the social society is made up of emergent phenomena. And, and not, only, not only that, but society over history continually constructs larger scale systems to have new forms of emergence. So we've moved to sort of, we've constructed socio-ecological systems like agriculture, bringing ecosystems into our domain of our complex adaptive systems, socio-technical systems like the Industrial Revolution and now, of course, the Internet Society, bigger and bigger interconnected complex adaptive systems with more emergence, uh, institutions, the economics, customs, religions, culture, social movements, all of these things that we think about in the social sciences. And as people ourselves, we are always co-creating or creating emergent phenomena. So when you think about uh, like jazz improv, a group of people, they're creating something emergent with collaborative emergence. We do that in theatre, but also just in conversation. You know, when we come up with ideas together, we're creating something emergent. And if the scales and kind of feedbacks are right for us, we're actually very good at steering emergence. So bringing up your children uh, is a steering emergence, I think. If you're good at marketing, you've got a nose for business. If you're leading a group of people, you're a great politician, or even facilitating a good workshop. That's all about trying to steer emergence. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what emergence looks like in the social systems. Um, hoping this is actually going to work. So this is a classic of the social sciences, uh, the Schelling model of residential segregation. So here you've got two types of agents, red and green. They're just two distinct types of agent. And each of these agents is, feels comfortable as long as there's about 30% of similar color agents around them in their neighborhood. If they feel uncomfortable, they move to another random empty cell. So a simple agent-based model. And the emergent phenomena here is that you get segregation between reds and greens in residential areas. So notice no one here feels they have to be in the majority. You know, 30% and this will happen. So you don't mind. Just, but you, know, you get this kind of unexpected emergent phenomena of cluster formation. And this has been used to explain the formation of segregation in cities. So you get this kind of emergent phenomena happening all the time in social systems. But more than that, in social systems, we get sort of second order emergence. So if you live in one of those patches, if you're a red or a green, you, got, you can see the emergent phenomena. You can see your neighborhood. And you can conceptualize it. You can grab it and reinforce and repurpose it. So hey, you've got your community identity. And you set up organizations to reinforce your community. So. Uh, you, you develop an identity, you develop um, some kind of idea of your emergence, and then maybe the rules of interaction change. You interact differently with people within your neighborhood, in your culture, and those outside it. So you're kind of grabbing onto emergence and using it. So I'd say this has happened in, in Brixton, where, where I live, which has been a predominantly Afro-Caribbean uh, community for a long time. You've had this segregation, and then there's a, there's a strong kind of culture and identity in Brixton. But then once this kind of emergence happens, this can sort of set off whole new chains of emergent processes. So here in Brixton, we've now got the gentrification of Brixton. So we even have a hip hop chip shop, would you believe? You know, the sort of level of ridiculousness. So you get just uh, processes unfolding. So society is just full of regularities forming, being perceived, being used, and setting up new emergent processes, emergent phenomena. OK. So I'll go on to, to what I work on, how we try to work with complex adaptive systems. So I work in the uh, in CCAM, which is the Center for the Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus, which is a lot of buzzwords. But essentially what that means is that, that we work directly with the UK government, with various departments, and our job is to put complexity thinking into the policy process. So this is really important, I think, because basically, I think all of the global challenges that we face involve the interaction of complex adaptive systems at different scales. 
So these are systems which have many interacting components, diverse interacting components, and those components are often evolving, uh, giving rise to unexpected system level behaviors like emergence, but, but plenty of other phenomena also. So things like ecosystems, economies, industrial networks, cities, technospheres, you know, all of these things are interacting together uh, and we need to be able to deal with these things if we're going to solve challenges like climate change or agricultural intensification or inequality. And we need different sorts of management philosophies for dealing with these systems because crucially when we try to make interventions, policy or otherwise, we're not intervening with static artifacts. We're intervening with complex processes, living and lifelike processes. And they will reconfigure in response to our interventions because they're adaptive. So essentially, the rules of the game change as we play it when we try to make policy in this sphere. And of course, in any real world system, we never have access to the full system description. We have some kind of incomplete picture. So again, when we intervene, we're extremely likely to get unexpected indirect effects from these systems, which have very long and complex causal chains within them, and which are open systems with new things coming in all the time. So both these things together mean that uh, we, we have a big problem. We can't just predict what we think is going to happen in the system and make a policy intervention like a silver bullet and have it work. We have to be continually prepared to adapt and work with the dynamics of the system. And these are not just technical problems that we have to solve as scientists or modelers or policymakers. All of the systems I'm talking about, all of the problems I'm talking about, they're profoundly social. So uh, and that means there are no right answers. There are things that work for some people and not for others. The people in the system have an opinion. And people's behavior in the system is intrinsically linked with the system's behavior itself. So, so what do we do? How do we develop this kind of new management philosophy? So we have this essential idea of sort of steering complex systems, trying to work with them in interaction. So continuously interacting with a system, making changes to the system or to its environment, giving, responding to the feedback that it gives us, seeing how it moves, and then continuing, continuing to interact and sort of manipulate it towards our goals. But crucially, we try to develop participatory methods to do this, bringing everyone in the system uh, into this process so that we're steering our complex systems. And to do that, we, we, we frame the work that we do in a kind of management, management cycle and a management process. This is something like an adaptive management cycle for those of you who know that kind of work. So at every step in this process, we are working with the system stakeholders, the people within the system. So we develop understandings of the system through modeling and participation. We look at what the plausible system scenarios could be and what its dynamics could be. Together, we think about what we want from the system, what are our goals. And then we crucially, we try to find ways to intervene with the system, to work with its complexity and with its dynamics. We try to find system levers, use those to design interventions. Uh, and then we have to design also monitoring procedures, metrics, ways, ways we can determine how the system is responding. So we make our interventions, we monitor, we learn, and we adapt, and then we change our intervention. But as I said, these systems themselves are adaptive. So of course, by doing this process, we learn more about the structure of the system, but the system is also going to change as we do this. So we have to continually go around this cycle. I think that's very important. That when we manage complex systems, complex adaptive systems, we're talking about an ongoing, long-term process of interaction with those systems, not finding the solution that's going to work for all time. So some of the kind of modest steps that we've taken towards this, uh, using techniques we've developed called participatory systems mapping. Um, so this is a pretty low-tech method to start with. So you can see us here. This is uh, working with groups of different stakeholders in, in government departments and in industrial regions, and essentially getting out the post-it notes so we bring people together, people, stakeholders in a system, to collaboratively construct simple systems models of their complex system. So that is, they think about what are all the factors or kind of key variables in their system, and together they discuss and decide and draw out what they think the causal interconnections are in those systems. 
So very simple, very kind of easy and unintimidating for people to get involved with. These are the kinds of things that we come up with. So the, this is a sort of relatively small map, but uh, this is a map of the development of the bio-based economy in the Humber region. It's a big industrial region in the UK, and this was made with industrialists, with the local government, uh, with the port authorities, uh, local NGOs and, and groups concerned with different aspects of the system. Um, what you can see is that these maps, they combine things from all sorts of domains, from sort of social, economic, environmental, political, we can bring everything together. And very importantly, we can put into these maps not just things that we can quantify, for example, we have fossil fuel price and things like that here, but also things that people think are important but that are qualitative. So community acceptance of new development or ecological sustainability, things that people know matter in their systems but that we can't make models of very easily. And between all these things, we have causal connections, positive causal correlations or causal effects and, and negative, which is simply proportional or inversely proportional effects. So this is a really good method to use when you've got a lot of intersecting issues, uh, different factors in lots of different domains and these kind of wicked problem spaces, as we call them. And when you know that you've got a lot of interdependency between systems components, lots of diverse perspectives to bring together, and when the state, what the stakeholders do really matters in the system. And crucially, of course, which is very often the case, when you haven't got data, you just have people's local knowledge, some experts, some kind of experiential knowledge. You bring people together to build this kind of intersubjective object, as we call it. So the word intersubjective, there again today. Uh, so we get, we get an intersubjective model. That means we're not pretending it's an objective model. It's a representation of the collective views of people in the system about how they think their system works. And it's really helpful, actually, for people, the process of doing this. They bring out their own tacit assumptions about how their system works. They start to understand each other and the mental models that others have in the system. You know, and they start to realize who they're actually indirectly connected to in the system, like what they do, how it's impacted on by others. So they build this collective understanding. And very importantly, they start to get this feeling of this being their complex system, that they're part of a complex system. So the process itself is very useful, but we can also go a bit further and, and get some sort of meaningful analysis out of this. <clears throat> I'll just skip over this, but there's, there's different ways you can construct this, um, but I think I'll, I'll come back to that. So we can actually analyze, we can analyze these systems in meaningful ways. So they're good thinking tools in their own right. So we can start from factors in these systems and explore, for example, what are the sort of causal effects downstream of a particular factor. So something that we want to change. So here, for example, the, the Environment Agency were thinking about changing the management regime in a barrage, in a river catchment. And the yellow factors below that are all functions or factors in the system that matter to all the different sorts of stakeholders in the system. So we can say, look at a change we want to make how that percolates through the system, and what are all the trade-offs between different people's interests. Similarly, we can think about factors that are vulnerable to external change, and what happens downstream from those, how those things are, you know, what sort of indirect effects we might get in the system. Uh, we can look at what feeds into outcomes that matter to us, all of the kind of causal connections above something that we want to achieve in the system. And we can also, we like to do a sort of functional network analysis. So we can look at this, this system essentially as a directed graph, and we can say which factors are most crucial here from a sort of mathematical perspective, firstly. So which are most influential, which say have high out degree, are very influential, high in degree, they might be very strongly influenced, or maybe between the centrality, things that are bridges between different parts of the network. But to actually make that useful in a social context, we combine that with subjective information from the stakeholders. So during the workshop, we collect from people, what are the things that, that matter to you? Or we start from, what are the key functions in the system? What are all the factors that are important to you? What are the things that you have some kind of control over? And what levels of control do you have? And different stakeholders have different levels of control. What are the things that are vulnerable to external change? And by combining these things together, we get a sort of subjective network analysis. 
So you imagine, for example, we have a factor that has a high uh, meaningful influence. So it's not just got a high out degree, but a couple of steps downstream for it, from it are a lot of factors that are important to people. So it has a high meaningful influence. And if that factor, if that factor is controllable, according to our, our stakeholders or some of our stakeholders, then it's a system lever that we can use. If it's something that no one can control, and potentially something that's got external vulnerability, then it's a, it's a vulnerability in our system, and we have to think about how to restructure to mitigate. And there's all sorts of kind of essentially design motifs that we can pull out from this subjective network analysis. You know, we can identify where we need to collaborate, where we might need to put things together, bridges in the network, what we really need to focus on. And we can also look at factors that may be canaries for system change. So unfortunately, I'm a bit hamstrung by the fact that my, the analysis that I do on these policy maps, which would demonstrate this, is confidential, uh, official sensitive material. So I can't show you a lot of detail. Um, you can talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but we can also just sort of do this visual analysis here that you can see. So things that are very useful for policymakers, a simple network analysis. So here we've got uh, all of the policies that we did work with the uh, department for energy and industrial strategy around energy security. There's lots of different policies in this domain. And here we've just pulled out the policies and their connections to factors in the system. You can see on the top where you've got potential policy clashes. So policies driving things in different directions um, or many sort of inputs into different policies. So here they found, for example, that they've got two different policies pushing investment signaling for nuclear in opposite directions. So this is a start of thing, sort of thing you can start to see by putting the whole system together. And then we start to look also at like policy synergies. Where are your policies actually working together? So hopefully it looks like here we've got uh, many policies pushing on the, or capacity for renewable energy security. So we can pull out where policies are clashing, where their potential synergies are, and, and reevaluate what we're doing that way. And this is very helpful because these policies will be done by completely different policy groups, even within one department. They probably don't know what each other are doing. That's what we very commonly find when we do this exercise. As I said, also we can do this sort of upstream analysis, where here this is a key outcome, again, for this department. They want consumer energy bills to go down. This is a big part of energy security. So this is everything that feeds into that. And you can see, for example, that they're really relying on reducing uh, um, levies on, um, on consumer bills. or well, they're, Actually, they're increasing a lot of levies on consumer bills, which is increasing consumer energy bills. So a lot of their policies here are actually increasing the levies on the bills, a huge number of things going into that factor, um, potentially clashing with uh, the, the other things that they're trying to do to bring down the prices. So you can start to unpick like, what is actually the context of my policy outcome. And again, this is quite simple, but very different from what policymakers normally do, in which you have a single policy, an outcome, and you just draw a single line with a couple of intervening steps. You have a linear theory of change. So here we can actually put the policy and its outcome in the context. So we can see what the externalities are. We can actually see our policies in the context of a complex system. Uh, much the, the big project that we're working on currently and that, that I've, I've been working on a great deal is doing a policy map and a systems map for the UK, uh, the UK rural system. So that is essentially all of the stakeholders, the farmers, the environmental land managers, the rural communities, the ecosystems, everything that makes up the, the rural system in the UK. Uh, and all of the policies you can see in blue here that we're thinking about developing as we have to rewrite all of this policy as we leave the EU. All of this policy will come back from Brussels. 70% of the department's policy has to be rewritten. So we're trying to do that in a, in a way that makes sense in terms of complex systems. So obviously, I can't put any labels on this, this graph. Um, you know, so I'm, there's not much I can tell you in detail about this, because again, it's official sensitive material. But you can see, just from looking at this, that this really shows people that they are in a complex system. This was done by a number of large policy teams, so animal and plant health and welfare, rural communities, environmental land management. 
and agricultural resilience and productivity. And they never get together in the same room. So by, by doing this, you know, putting this together, they immediately started to understand where their policies interconnected. And that we've also brought together in this map, not just policies in blue and policy outcomes in yellow, but I think really crucially, what stakeholders are interested in. This is all of these, uh, these, these red factors in here. So um, we really try to focus their minds on the whole system, you know, not just their policies and their outcomes, but what, what they do means for the entire complex adaptive system itself. And doing this work, it certainly allows them to see things that they, they, they've never seen before. So you can see a sort of large red stakeholder interest here, something that's crucial in rural communities and something that DEFRA, in fact, um, that influences a lot of their policy outcomes. But actually, this, this particular stakeholder interest, they realized after doing this, it's very influential, that the only policy that's going into it is from the Treasury, not from them at all. So huge parts of the system that they're trying to influence with policy is actually just controlled by another department. So it's this kind of stuff that you can try to pull out and try to see what you're doing in a real complex systems context. So. Um, Maybe in five years' time, I'll be able to give you the details of this uh, work when it's cleared for publication. But I think uh, for now, the message of what we're trying to do here is we're trying to kind of use these quite simple and, you know, what might seem even kind of noddy methods, essentially to transform this overwhelming complexity um, of the system into actionable complexity. So not just helping people construct their idea of their complex adaptive system and see what that means in terms of interconnections. But to say, we can unpick parts of this, we can explore it from your perspective, and uh, we can make this, we can, we can provide actionable complexity, complexity appropriate thinking and intervention. Okay, so what I wanted to then think about with this is how, and hopefully this is a sort of discussion that I'd like to invite you to, to for, for lunch is how does uh, emergence fit into this kind of, of scheme? I mean, we really don't particularly uh, directly talk about emergence. We don't, we don't model, like, unlike the sort of agent-based models that I showed you, we're not, we're not seeing emergent phenomena come out of these maps, except potentially in the weak sense that we see things like system keystone species or something like that in the complex adaptive system. You might think these structural nodes may be in some sense emergent. But what's really interesting about this kind of stuff is how readily people include emergent phenomena in their systems maps. As I said, I think people are all very familiar in social systems with emergence. So we very commonly see people putting in nodes like uh, social exclusion, loneliness, resilience, uh, community sentiment, uh, acceptance development, things that are emerging from the system. And then it's also interesting to see like, how much easier it is for people to put the outward causal arrows from those emergent phenomena than, of course, the inputs you know, to the emergent phenomena. So you often see, often see a sort of gap. We don't quite know how this thing arises. So in the spirit of our kind of making complexity quick and easy for people, um, I'd be really interested to think about how, what, what might be the ways to start integrating that kind of pro process in this model. I think there's a role for simple agent-based models to look at what kinds of qualitative dynamics or emergent effects we could get from types of system. But what I'd really like us to be able to do is say in these systems, in this adaptive management process where we're not predicting, we're just getting ready to interact with the system, how could we be alert to the possibility of emergence in these systems? What kind of structures and factors would we be able to pull out to say we should be alert to emergence here? Or do we simply have to say, well, this is part of our, this is part of our adaptive management process and the emergence will arise, but we're ready because we know that we're continually interacting with the system. I think something that I'd like to explore further with these particular models, particularly with the DEFRA map, which is sort of, this was sort of behind my thinking of getting all of the system functions in there and the stakeholder interests. Is, as well as that being important for policy, is whether we could think about meaningful system-level properties in these, these systems as we've drawn them themselves. So I, you know, in an intersubjective object, is it meaningful to think about resilience, or how might we think about that? 
But if we've got all these different variables that matter to different people, in some sense, those are sort of essential variables of this complex adaptive lifelike system. Could we think about homeostasis of the system? Could we think about how to create a self-maintaining system that maintained all of these essential variables for the people within it? That would be a kind of fun direction for policy to go in. Um, <clears throat> and just to, to wrap up on the couple of minutes I've got left. So this is just one small approach. And I'm not saying that the method we do uh, is, is, is the method. I think what's crucial here is this philosophy of steering complex adaptive systems. And we do methods that work in, within the constraints of policy making. It has to be very quick. You have to have answers very quickly. And essentially, it's this idea of providing thinking tools for the people in the system, not us as experts of some kind providing answers. But there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to do to develop that further, you know, to bring in models. But I think this is really crucial for us now. I mean, I think more and more, as we are entering really the, or we are in the Anthropocene, we have more and more, more and more rapidly developing new complex adaptive systems coming into play. And I think, or I'd like to suggest maybe that we actually have more emergence going on in the Anthropocene, that maybe we have this large scale rapid emergence now. So we have expanded connectivity and interaction across new scales, a lot of energy flowing through the system, the scales of our metabolic processes bringing new sorts of interactions into play that didn't exist before. So our interaction with climate and the huge selective pressures that we're imposing on ecosystems through globalization and climatic change. There are more possible interactions, and there's more potential for positive feedbacks and more rapid positive feedbacks. So we're seeing this huge explosion of emergent processes and phenomena in our system, which pose existential risks to us. So I think that to address these issues, we need to bring in you know, the natural sciences, the earth sciences, the biology, of course, and the social sciences together but I think we need to put these into a context where we, we put them into a democratic context, you know, a participatory context where we as a society and people together can manage these challenges, can manage these, uh, these complex systems. So in, within this framework that I have of participatory steering of complex systems, I think we have some sort of key challenges around emergence, um, so you know, how could we be alert to the possibility of emergence in these systems? So you know, what are the tells that we should be expecting emergence? Really crucially, how could we prepare to observe and monitor unexpected emergence on unknown scales with the interaction of unknown processes and variables? You know, how do we actually build in monitoring to be able to do this adaptive management if we don't know at what scales we're looking or where we're looking? How do we find levers to steer emergence as it arises and move it? You know, what are the crucial the levers? And also, really importantly, how can we use emergence? How can we co-opt it? We know that we do that all the time, and people will do that reactively. But how can we create contexts, for example, that will foster beneficial emergence, things that we want to see emerging? You know, how can our policy or our decision making actually really work with emergence, with the dynamics of complex systems, and make it happen? And going back to the kind of Zhao's improv in some sense, how can we leverage our capacity to detect and steer human scale emergence in larger scale systems? We, we have these kind of cognitive capacities to detect emergence and to interact with it. Can we look at methods like immersive simulation, like experiential methods? in which we can create new feedbacks for ourselves, new causal links, and actually experience emergence for ourselves in such a way that we can think about these systems differently and uh, interact with them and gain a sort of intuition of complex systems. Um, essentially, finally, really, and how do we connect together all of the disciplines that come, into <laughs> come together in thinking about the Anthropocene to do this all in socio-ecological, economic, technical systems at global, global scales. So that's the challenge. <clears throat> um, I've run out of time, so uh, I won't tell you about the, well, I'll just give you a trailer. It, we've done some, I did some work last time I was here on getting, thinking about experiencing 
the city of Tokyo as a higher level complex adaptive system in its own right, as an ecosystem, by bringing together citizen science with microbiology and sort of experiential methods and walking meditations and getting people to experience the city. There's some really lovely work that we did. It was great fun. I'm hoping to kind of go further with that. So please, uh, please come and talk to me about that as well, because it's, it's super cool. It's super fun. It's quite far away from being able to deliver it to a policymaker in the UK government at the moment. But um, <clears throat> as regards to these, uh, these challenges I spoke about, I, you know, there's, there's lots for us to do here around emergence. Huge challenges, but crucial, vital challenges that we need to deal with today. So please come and talk about that at lunch, because I'd love to get your input. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Alex knows so much, so trying to distill what she knows into 30 minutes to deliver it to us so we can gain something. I really appreciate the, the, the effort you've done into this. That was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So uh, the questions are coming. Do we want to take a question from the... Uh, oh, dear. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Uh, so can I see the hands again? Let's see. I'm going to throw it. I, we're, we'll work toward the back. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to give you an opportunity to talk more about that last study. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, sure, I can do that. We've oh. unplugged on. Yeah, I think Lily was next. And then goes. Should I just go through it for like two minutes? So, oh, where is it? So essentially, um, this is just a a fun idea that combined a few different things that uh, myself and um, my colleague Hiroki Agura uh, had, had done previously. Um, so what we did was we, we found a lot of different neighborhoods in Shibuya, which is a very, very varied place, you know, very overwhelming place. And I think when you're kind of there particularly, you get this idea of the city as an organism, of Tokyo as a huge organism. So we picked different places from the sort of river to the shrine to this very old-fashioned passage with lots of tiny bars to the red light district. And we went round these places with a, a group of people um, and took samples of, we, we asked people to choose objects that represented that area. And basically, Hiroku has a, a nice uh, system for growing up fungi particularly. So he has a kind of glucose-based oh medium, gosh. quite a simple procedure. Um, and we used, we used his fungal system. And we basically we just stick the objects in there and we, we grow up uh, some of the communities that are, that, are, that are in the streets. So I haven't got a very high-res photo. But you can see we've got loads of very cool stuff out of here. We've got them, you know, the fag from outside, the, the cigarette, I should say, uh, from outside the bar and all sorts of stuff growing on that. We've got bits of roof tile from the temple. We've got all sorts of different nice yeasts and things going on there. Lots of different fungi. This is an anal relaxant packet that someone found in the red light district, which um, had a lot of uh, yeast growth off it. <laughs> and from the river, we've got loads of lovely bacteria and fungi um, also growing. So we've got these nice kind of mini ecosystems or ecological systems. And basically, we did a procedure where we just got people to explore and look at those systems. So to kind of take the lids off and smell the cultures, to really look at them, and to try to pull out all of the sort of ecological processes that they could see going on there. So something that I've done previously in woodland ecosystems, but we've never actually done it with microbial systems. So it's very nice. You, you can pull out lots of stuff. You can see competition, coexistence, lots of different niches, diversity, um, resource cycling, you know, sorts of things going on in the system. So you kind of really get people's heads into processes. And then we go out into Shibuya at night and walk around the system doing an experiential walk, which is essentially you're walking in silence, but prime everyone to really sort of use all of their senses and kind of observe and to try and think about processes in the city organism. So we walked around, and I ran a sort of meditation activity as well at some point to get people really into this. And then people came back and, and drew what they sort of felt or perceived in the city. And you just, it was very, very interesting. All these kind of diverse sort of sensory ideas that people had, the sort of parts of the city that were like spiky and difficult to deal with, parts that felt very organic, uh, different sorts of emotions and things or feelings associated with different parts of the city. 
um, after we ran the meditation, I got people saying, I felt as if I was a blood cell in a giant city alien organism, or, you know, they felt, you know, people felt very, uh, very strong sensations, and it was, it was really, very interesting. So that was a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, but I think it, ultimately what I'm going to try and do with it, we're going to develop that more because it's just great fun, you know, and it really gets people's heads into thinking about different levels of system. But there's, there's a, I've got a lot of interest in how people interact intuitively with complex adaptive systems and engineered systems or, or different, sorts of, uh, different sorts of systems. And this is going to connect for me, I think, ultimately into a project of what I mentioned to you there, leveraging our capacities to detect systems. Maybe this is just a fun way to get people into the city. I mean, that's, that's cool in its own right. But I think ultimately there's, there's something interesting about um, how we can help ourselves use that capacity that we have to sort of to enter into complex systems, how we can kind of open ourselves up to that, but how we can give ourselves useful feedbacks from the system and give ourselves useful levers with these sort of higher level systems. So we're going to be working with the Arizona Synthesis Lab to look at, say, immersive simulation on models and systems to do that. But I think there's just loads of mileage uh, in that sort of stuff. And it's really good fun. So, uh, yeah, I'd love okay. to... I'll have to... Uh, we Sorry. We need uh, to go on any <laughs> questions. So if you want to know more, come uh, join us for lunch today. So, Lindy, you have the box? I do. I have the box. Hi, Alex. I'm Lindy. Hi. I'm from ASU, actually. Um, and I, I hope this um, this is a little bit of a of, a, of an open ended question, but mm -hmm. I hope that you might have a couple of pithy things to add. I'm really uh, intrigued by the participant participant mapping concept. Mm -hmm. I'm running um, a convening in the spring, uh, uh, bringing together uh, many stakeholders around the future of humans in space to see if we can work on, um, on more collaborative different kinds of business models about how our space futures might work. And it occurred to me while I was looking at that that we might want to do that in the workshop. Uh, and I wonder if you, um, if you have any pointers for, for uh, you know, doing this at home and, yeah. uh, and, and how we might process meaningful outcomes from it. Yeah, so I have a lot of materials online that I, I can um, point you to of like how to run these sort of workshops and sort of ways to, ways to analyze it. Uh, and we could also, of course, talk about your particular, your particular sort of outcomes that you want. Because a lot, we actually have to do quite a lot of design of the workshop processes to fit in with the different outcomes that people want. But, right. So we tailor, but we, we've got big, long guides online. And we do actually have some online software in which you can capture these systems mm -hmm. and then work with them over time, you know, uh, to actually sort of have them as living documents. But I think it's important actually to do the first stages round the table because that emergent kind of idea of the system comes from people talking together. But yeah, I can definitely, uh, definitely help you out with that. Great. So if I go to your center's website, I might find these things? Yeah, or I'll, and I'll give you some other. You know, Thank you very much. No worries. Right, thank you. For now, let's go to the to the screen to the Slido, and we have some questions coming up. Uh, I thought maybe Lindy's question kind of segues into the question that's second on the screen uh, about best practices and object guidelines constructing these graphs and networks. How could one measure the quality of the network? Uh, so well. Essentially, there, there is a sort of best practice, and there are, there are things that you, you have to do a lot of rounds of verification with this type of network. I mean, you're always going to have an intersubjective object, but it could be sort of obviously skewed, you know, when you see that there's like areas of the map which have huge numbers of connections in them, and others that are very sparse, you know, that that's just someone's kind of pet project. When you're running the thing itself, you have to uh, think about sort of steering the group dynamics so that you've not just got powerful voices in and sort of a lot of work in kind of setting it up to make sure that people are, are give, you know, you've got the diversity of people there to cover the system. And essentially, there are a lot of, when you look at the network, you can often tell if it's just biased or skewed, and you would go through a process of verification with people. So, yes, there are best practice uh, guidelines. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, the question that's risen to the top is wouldn't this kind of information be extremely valuable to lobbyists for good or, or ill influence public policy? Can we keep these tools in benevolent <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that we can keep anything in benevolent hands, quite honestly. I mean, <laughs> but uh, I think that has to, to me, this kind of come back, comes back to something that I think is really important around complex adaptive systems in the social realm, is that we have to have a kind of a public 
understanding of complexity. And we need to sort of create new narratives that are commonplace in the media and in society so that we can think about complex adaptive systems. Uh, you know, so the ideas of emergence or self-organization or, or tipping points and feedbacks, if they were in common currency, people, everyone would be able to, to think about and evaluate things uh, in, a, you know, in a more informed way. And for me, the real goal of this ultimately would be completely participatory complexity science and decision making. Like, so if we hold the maps together, if people in a system know what that maps look like, map looks like, and in fact, with some of the departments, we are talking about making these completely publicly available systems maps, so for open policy making. So if everyone can go and look at that map, then the lobbyist, yeah, can, can say, well, you know, I'm pushing on this thing. But everyone else also holds this idea of the system and its interconnections. And so it becomes a tool for kind of informed democracy. And I think that the openness is the only way you can really kind of counter, counter that, essentially. I don't think it's by controlling the information. I think it's by opening it out and creating a societal dialogue around complexity that we can counter these things. Great. So I'm going to let uh, Tony ask the last question, and then we're going to move on to the next speaker. So in the first, one of the first systems you showed, based on like mathematical rules, you see the clustering reach some type of equilibrium state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happens when, if you have external forces that are also um, affecting that? For example, like if you have people working together in the participatory systems mapping and yeah. one or more of the people making the map have some different type of utility which it's in their interest to work against the group to produce a result that isn't the equilibrium state, if you will. What's the result of that and how would one get around that, I guess? Um, so I guess it's two different things. I mean. Uh so, I mean, the maps are sort of essentially snapshots in time. The agent-based models, you know, the one I showed you had an equilibrium, but it also works as an open system in which you have replacement of agents over time. So there, I mean, I think this is something really interesting about this. How do we actually move these kind of methods on to looking at manipulating uh, stability landscapes or creating contexts such that we can help people think about where they want to move their system to and choose between different sort of outcome states? You know, that's something we could do with more extended agent-based modeling, maybe. Uh, so, but how do we, how do we work against um, agents of different utilities? Well, I think that the point is trying to kind of capture that. You know, essentially, within these maps, we have many different viewpoints. And often in a process like this, we might actually try to do, we, we could even try to do separate maps where there are people with very different interests. Um, you know, and their, their sort of version of the map is also captured. But um, it's a difficult question. I mean, it depends, it depends on what context you're talking about. If it's in the group itself, as a facilitator, you have to try to kind of detect it and, and diffuse it. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's in society more, more broadly, well, I think, again, it comes back, comes back to that sort of question of, of, of openness, of the openness of the system. Does that answer... Kind of your question, I don't really, yeah, I, I think it's a, it depends in what context you're talking about it, but. All right, yeah. thank you very much. It's a subjective object, as I say, so it's about manipulating that process. Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> let's thank Alex again.